So good morning again, morning. and happy Sabbath to all. This has been um, a bit of a, a divisive period of time, I think, that we've all experienced. Oh, thank you. Over the last several months, um, or actually over a year and a half now, we're, it, it just feels like we're more polarized and more divided than ever. There is no more middle for anything. It just feels like everything has become um, um, either my way or the highway. And I have a problem. I have a problem with that because we are, as a Christian body, as Christians, followers of Jesus, to be united in the mission and, the, and, and not the method, but the mission of carrying the gospel message to the whole world. That's really supposed to be our job. So we do it different ways, but we're to come together for that, um, for that sort of unification of that general purpose and goal and objectives that we have. I know I've probably talked way too many times about uh, missions and what that means to me when, when I when I was in the military, we were given a mission. Uh, we completed that mission, even if it meant it cost us our lives. And, and I believe that the mission we have from God is even more important, and that is to carry the gospel message to all the world. And we can't be afraid of the consequences of doing God's work. We need to just step out in faith and do it, and whatever happens, happens. Um, you know, what's the Bible say? If God is for us, then what? That's right. Who can be against us? Now, a lot of people can be against us. So let's, there's the honest part of it. If God is for me, people can still be against me. But what it means is that the consequences that I experience are, are going to be um, righteous and justified. I'm not going to be lost in that. Uh, Psalm 133.1 uh, says that, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. And would you agree with this? I mean, what's easier, to be unified or to be divided? How, how many are in relationships, have been in relationships? You ever had, like, difficulty in that relationship? Disagreements? Yeah, yeah okay, knockdown drag outs or whatever they would be. And isn't it a whole lot less comfortable in that situation than when you're both on the same page? marching to the same beat, moving in the same direction. But the problem is, is that we run into this issue of um, confounding variables, obfuscations of what unity is about. And there's two particular areas that I'm going to talk about today. And one is called uniformity, which is not unity. And the other is unanimity, which is not necessarily unity. Now, those can be components or parts of it, but unity takes on a bigger picture. So let's start with talking about what is the heart of unity? Where do we get the heart of this unity from in the Bible? And it actually comes from the Shema, which is Deuteronomy 6, uh, 4 uh, and 5, 4 in particular. Um, in Hebrew, this is Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And it says in English, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But, and there tends to be a bit of controversy. I found this out several weeks ago when somebody came up to me, a person who um, does not subscribe to uh, the triune Godhead. They have a different idea, believing that the Holy Spirit in particular is not part of, of the, um, the, the Holy Trinity or the, the triune Godhead. Um, and that is that the word one here is the word echad. And the word achad means a single entity, but made up of more than one part. Now, again, there will be people that will argue uh, that the, the word achad is used uh, hundreds of times in the Bible, and sometimes it's used when there's only uh, a numerical uh, definition of one. But there tends to be another Hebrew word called yachid, and there's one yachad, which also refer to a singularity or from a standpoint of a numerical one. But Echad is not that. It's not a numerical uh, definer in a sense. It is talking about 
a, um, a unification, if you will, of this idea of one. And so, um, uh, again, if you talk to other people, they may disagree with that. That's fine. But I'm taking this from my being brought up Jewish and the, the study of the Torah and the study of the Hebrew language is that's what it, it means. So what it is is that word echad is the confirmation of Elohim, which talks about the Lord our God. 1 Peter 3, 8, 9 says, Finally, all of you being of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Okay, so let's talk about the three sides of this triangle, if we will, of unity. So there's unanimity. Now I'm going to get into this in more detail in just a minute. But in general, unanimity is where there's an agreement by all parties. So it's what's often known as a consensus. So if I were to say, uh, how many people like pickles with their, with their sandwich? And everybody raised their hands and said, we all like pickles with our sandwich. What a horrible example. I just <laughs> didn't prepare in advance for another example. But I just got this image of these little sliced pickles on my sandwich, which I really like. It. And that word picture is gone now. Now it is. Okay. So everybody raises their hands and everybody agrees with that. We have what's called a consensus in statistics. Um, when I'm working on a case, I will pull a statistically valid random sample of a larger universe in order to infer the results of that sample to that universe. But if I wanted to audit, for example, or look at every single unit within the universe, there's a term for that, and it's called a census. And that means that we've looked at everything that there is to look at. Now, there's another one, which is uniformity, and that is the state of always having the same form. It's um, where we, we practice our beliefs, but we all do it exactly the same way. We look the same, act the same, talk the same, use the same words all the time. Th the problem with uniformity is that this is where a lot of uh, cults are, um, are involved in this idea of uniformity, or it helps even to define a cult, because there's no room for any, um, any free thinking or independent thoughts or opinions. And then you have unity. Unity is a state of mind. Unity is a concept. It's a construct where we are joined together as a whole. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they are unified into the Godhead, which we refer to as God. Okay? It's one mind, one spirit, one purpose, one mission, one goal. And that's what we should be doing as Christians. We should be working together to manage through this. So let's talk about uh, unanimity um, first. So it's a condition of complete agreement by all parties. Acts 2.1 says, When the day of Pentecost had, fully co had come fully, they were all with one accord in one place. So we had unanimity here, right? They're up in the upper room and the, and the Holy Spirit comes like tongues of fire. And now they're all in one accord. They're all um, with the same purpose and goals and objectives. But there's no disagreement. Remember when the, when the disciples would get together with Jesus? It was just this constant bickering. I don't know how he handled it. I don't know how he didn't just like vaporize them sometimes because there was this just constant bickering going on all the time, complaining and, and just, you know, a total sense of disunity amongst, amongst the disciples at many times. And this idea of unanimity would have been where they all sat at the table and they all agreed with one accord who, for example, might be the best, who's going to be sitting on the right hand of God, right? Who's going to be the most important in the kingdom of heaven? Those questions wouldn't have come up under this concept of unanimity. Acts 15, 36 to 39 says, Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they were doing, right? So they're like together. They, they have this same uh, concept of how they're going to do these things. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. So what happened here? Is this unanimity 
It's not anymore because they've parted ways because of a disagreement they had over whether they should have taken somebody on this trip or not. This is the idea of unity. Their goals and objectives were still the same, which was to carry the gospel message, but they weren't going to do it exactly in the same way. So can you have unity without unanimity? Yes, you can, right? And in fact, it often happens that way because we are a free-thinking, free-will, um, often cantankerous group of people, and we have different approaches in order to solve problems and, and to uh, spread the gospel message. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. So again, it says, Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So we have the unity here, right? But they're doing it different ways. People are going their own way to get things done. 1 Corinthians 12 uh, 27 says, now you are the body of Christ and members what? Individually. Individually. So we have the body of Christ and there is a unity in that, right? That body of Christ is, uh, is um, unified for the purpose of serving God, but each body part has its own particular function. And so we are in the church. We're not a bunch of automatons. We don't, you know, when people say, oh, we all march to the same drummer, but but we don't. I got that word picture of, you know, being in the military and boot camp and you're graduating and everybody's marching to, to um, Sousa's, um, whatever that classical piece is that he does, where everybody's marching to this one piece. That is uniformity, that is unanimity, but it doesn't necessarily characterize the idea of unity is what we are supposed to have as Christians. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Okay? All right. So we know what unanimity is, right? That's a consensus, which is different from uni uh, unity, which is a, a construct of everybody being on, uh, moving towards the same goals or the same objectives. But we know that we can come from different directions, right? Which would violate the rules of unanimity. So we can have unity without that unanimous component to it. What about uniformity? The uniformity is being the same, so not varying um, in uh, any way, not being different in any way. So there's this group of wonderful Christians um, up north. Um, I hope that wasn't me. Yep. Up north, where we actually they're all over the world, I guess, but up in upstate New York, they're called the 12 tribes. Beautiful people. And they are a group of Christians that take on the New Testament church. They live in a, in a communities. Um, and uh, they're just, they have a beautiful message of, of Jesus. They really do. But, Susie, what? And the health message, and they keep the Sabbath. Yeah, and the health message, and they keep the Sabbath. They're just wonderful people. And we're friends with many of them, and we, we spend time with them up there. But there's only one way to do things. One time, one of the guys came to me, and he said, I'm worried about your salvation. And I said, why is that? He said, because you haven't joined us yet, our organization or our, our group. And I said, well, why would I do that? He said, well, this is the only true message that there is. And I said, well, I believe that you have a true message, but it's not the only one. You know, there's many ways that, um, that the gospel message is spread. I remember hearing a preacher one time saying, he said, thank God for Christian businessmen who are not in the ministry. Because, you know, I sit up here in the pulpit, and I can preach, and I'm preaching to the choir. You guys are here, right, because this is what you believe. But when I get out into a conference somewhere, and I'm speaking to a room full of people, and I'm, I'm lecturing on something, I throw in things about being a Christian. People know that I'm a Christian from, from the examples uh, that I give. And sometimes there's more power in that than there is in trying to get people to church, you know? So we can practice this without being the same. Well, the thing about them is, they all dress the same. They all take on the same names, Hebrew names. They change their names to Hebrew names. They wear the same clothes. Um, uh, the, the guys all have, grow out the hair and have the ponytails and the beards. And so they, if you walk, you can't tell the difference from one to another sometimes. They look alike, they use the same words, the same language, and they act the same. That is uniformity. That is not unity. 
Uh, Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right? So we're his workmanship. God created us in his image. Right? There's no question about that. But through the history of time and, and since, um, since sin occurred in the Garden of Eden, we live in this fallen world, everything's different. Nobody, no, unless you have a doppelganger, most people do not look the same. Um, actually, I used to sit sometimes, I'd go, like if I was at the airport, I would just sit and watch. And I was just fascinated. There would be thousands of people going by and every one of those thousand people looked different from the person before. How's that even possible with the limited structure, say, of the human face, the limited number of bones and muscles in the face? How is it possible that you could see a thousand people and no two people look alike? It's just incredible. Yet, if somebody who I knew came into that airport, my brain would instantly respond to recognizing them, their face, and I would know who they were. Luke 22, 24 says, now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest, right? That's not uniformity. And in fact, it violated the concept of unity that we were dealing with. So the question is, can we have unity without uniformity? Yeah. We can, okay? Colossians 2, 6 to 10 says, and now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. So what it's saying is, is that everything we do should be built on the construct of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, but not that we all have to do everything exactly the same and look the same. Um, it says, then your faith will grow in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world, rather from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. Amen. So what are we saying here? We don't need anything else. We have Jesus. That's all we need. We, you know, maybe, maybe our, our goal should be to move more towards the New, um, uh, the new Testament church. I, 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 just, I don't know how that works sometimes. We as a community, we help each other out. As a family, we don't live together. When I grew up, um, I grew up in, in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood, and, and my, my grandparents lived um, a short ways away. It was a Hasidic neighborhood. It was a very ultra-Orthodox, almost cultish type of Jewish um, community. And um, um, we would uh, walk to synagogue on, on Shabbat mornings, and everybody looked the same, right? All the guys wore the, the talit, and they, they had the setas, the the sideburns and the hats and, and, and the wives didn't, it was interesting, they just dressed however they wanted to. <laughs> there wasn't really much uniformity in how the women dressed, but the men in particular it was. Do you know that in, um, uh, in, in, when we grew up I always wondered why it was that the women always walked behind the men, the men never walked behind the women. And I asked my grandfather that one time and he said because on Shabbat our minds are supposed to be on God only. And if we were walking behind the women, we might get distracted. <laughs> I know, isn't that cool? That's what my grandpa told me. He said, so that's why the women walk behind the men. And today, we see that when we come to church every morning on Trinity, there used to be a Chabad there, which is like a Jewish school and, and synagogue where they train uh, uh, people into the uh, rabbinical um, ministries. And then it must have closed down because of the pandemic. But we used to come in every morning and there would be these Jewish people that lived in the complex down the street and they would walk to synagogue every morning and, and they would, you know, have with their kids and all. It was actually pretty cool. What's that? Every Sabbath. Or, yeah, every Sabbath morning that we would come in. So anyway, um, so it says, for uh, in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you, are all, you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. So we are not bound by these rules of, uni of uniformity. You know, if, if you went out into the community up there, you'd recognize that those people were uh, 12 tribe members. Not by what they said, but by how they looked. If we go out, people don't look and say, oh, that's a uh, Seventh-day Adventist because we all dress 
a certain way or look a certain way. Now, you know, they should recognize that we're Christians by the way we talk and by the way we interact with people and all that, but, but we don't have this sort of uniform look to it. And the danger of uniformity, Miss White writes this, this is beautiful. She says, in the visible creation, divine wisdom is manifested in an endless variety of processes. She says, uniformity is not the rule that is followed in the kingdom of nature. Neither is it the rule that is followed in the kingdom of grace. In different ways, God works to attain one purpose, the saving of souls. By different methods, the gracious Redeemer deals with different minds. The change of heart is as truly wrought out by one process as by another. It is the Lord working upon minds and molding characters. Isn't that beautiful? We have to be careful about criticizing people for the way they choose to witness to others. And I think, I, I've, act, I've seen it, you know, I've heard it, where, oh, well, you should do it this way, and you should say this, and you should do it that way. You know, I got my own way of doing it. I don't really get into Bible discussions with people very much because there's always someone who's going to find a verse in the Bible to counter what you're trying to say, and you never win an argument when you're arguing theology. I've never seen anybody win a theological argument. But if I tell people my own personal story about what Jesus Christ did for me in my life, that's something that they can't deny. Right? That is my truth and my reality. And, and in doing it that way, if each of us, think about this, if we had one person who was trying to figure out what they wanted to do with their lives, and each of us only told them our own salvation story, imagine the power, powerful impact that would have on a person rather than just reading to them out of the Bible. If, if a dozen people said, this is what Jesus did for me. It becomes a lot easier for someone to believe that that message is true. But what's the saying? If one person tells you you're a horse, they're a liar. If two people tell you you're a horse, it's a conspiracy. But if three or more people tell you you're a horse, it's probably time to start looking for a saddle, right? So, so when many people or multiple people witness to a person with their salvation story, not by reading the same verse out of the Bible. Well, Psalm says, and, and you know, Isaiah says, and, and, and you know, Paul says, and Jesus says. Some of these people don't even believe the Bible is the inspired written word of God. They don't even think that Jesus might be the Messiah. We have to start with our, and this is where this uniformity breaks off. And the danger of uniformity is giving someone the same message over and over again in the same way. Eventually, if they don't believe it, they're not going to believe it from no matter how many people they hear it. But if we each tell our own personal salvation story, that's very difficult to argue. Um, have you ever seen a bait ball? I was going to do the video, but it was a little bit long. What a bait ball is, these are mackerel. Um, and, and what happens is when a fish goes after a school, a big fish, like a shark or a tuna, goes after let's say a, um, a school of these mackerel, they form a bait ball. They get into a ball and they swim around in circles really fast forming this sphere because what happens when they do that is the fish cannot pick out, the big fish can't pick out a single fish to eat. And so eventually, eventually they break this. The way they do it is many more uh, the big fish, the predators will come and they will charge through the bait ball and split them up. Okay. But when it starts like this, this unity that you see here, this getting together for the purpose of survival, um, many times will prevent anybody, any of the little fish, from getting eaten because the big fish can't get access to them because it's this constant spinning. So if you've never seen it, if you ever look at YouTube or anything, <clears throat> just put up bait ball and watch it. It is absolutely fascinating to see how these fish can unify in order to, to save themselves. So what may be seemingly um, oxymoronic is how we could have unity in diversity, right? Because it would seem that those two words are diametrically opposed, that they would be antithetical to each other. But in fact, they're not. And 1 Corinthians explains this. In 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11, it says there are diversities of gifts, but in the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, 
but in the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But in the manifestations of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of what? All. all. So each one of us is given a gift, not for our own personal edification, but to profit and benefit everybody who's part of the church. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by what? The same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, <coughs> to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills. Is independence a bad thing? I would say only when it's individualized. When we take the independence and we individualize it, when it becomes I instead of us, then it becomes a problem because we, look, we start to become self-focused and self-centered. And when we do that, then there's no room for the Holy Spirit to come in and to guide us. And so we break away from that idea of this unification of unity and we start to do things on our own. That doesn't work. We should be independent in the way we approach our ministries and our witnessing, <clears throat> but we have to be unified in the idea that, that that all has to come from the Holy Spirit. We open our mouths, it should be the Holy Spirit that's guiding the words that come out, not, not us. I can say that for me, for sure. United we stand. When the body of Christ grows, people are freed, right? They're being freed from bondage of sin, uh, from eternal condemnation. Um, lives are being changed. Have you seen this? People's lives are completely changed, and they're changed for the better. Ephesians 4, 1 to 6 says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one, now listen, one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in the hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. One body, right? And what is that one body? That's us. That's the body of Christ. One spirit. There's one hope. There's one faith. One baptism. One Lord. One God. I mean, how much easier could it get? Right? This type of a singularity, in my opinion, makes the gospel message um, easier uh, to understand. It, it doesn't become an intellectual challenge. It, it doesn't have to be an emotional roller coaster. It's a simple um, approach. It's a simple concept that there is, look, may, maybe it's not so simple, I don't know. It feels it to me that there's God the Creator, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I read that in Genesis. That, that because we are recalcitrant sinners, that, that the Heavenly Father gave up His only begotten Son, sent Him here to take on the burden of our sin. He went to a terrible death on the cross, but yet He resurrected Himself three days later. And He's now back in heaven preparing a place for us and he's soon to come and take us back with him. It, it's not a hard story. I mean, it may sound too good to be true, but maybe sometimes if something sounds too good to be true, maybe, maybe it is true when it comes to the supernatural, um, the supernatural. United we stand, divided we fall. I, uh, I heard someone say once, if we don't hang together, then we'll hang separately. Matthew 12, 22 to 30 says, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now, when the Pharisees heard it, right, because they were jealous of everything that Jesus did, they said, 
This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. I love Jesus. He's just such a witty guy. You know, he's just, I mean, probably because he never drank or did drugs or spent time on social media or watched TV or his brain was so perfectly focused. Immediately he knows what to say. He knew their thoughts. Think about that. So there, before they even say it, I see him getting ready going, oh, this is going to be fun, right? He knew their thoughts and he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. And I imagine the Pharisees just went, just frustrated, like they wish he would have said something stupid or not said anything at all, just walked away and they could have bragged about how they were right. But he cut them down at the knees, right, in just a, a simple statement. He said basically that any kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Nobody disagreed with that. So how could it be possible that he casts out demons by the king of the demons, right? That was the argument and it was obviously not true. In summary, in closing, Doris, another danger that, and this is from the Review and Herald, July 10th, another danger that threatens the church is individual independence. There is a manifest disregard of the prayer of Christ that his brethren should be one as he and the Father were one. Let the church to a man, say to a person, feel its responsibility to preserve harmony of thought and action. Let every member seek to be in accord with the truth and with the brethren. Let our prayers go forth from unfeigned lips that the union for which our Lord prayed may be found among his people. All who are united in church capacity may be of one mind, of one heart, of one judgment, that Satan may not take any fresh advantage of the followers of Christ. Here's how I see it. We should be one big bait ball. That's what we should be. We should be gathering together as Christians in this bait ball, together, supporting each other, um, unifying together so that Satan can't catch any one of us outside that bait ball, because that's how he gets us. We leave the herd and we are exposed and vulnerable because we can't fight him on our own. But together, with the Spirit of God in the middle of us all, how could we possibly lose? Because if... If, if God is with us, it says, who can be against us? It says, Satan may not take any fresh advantage of the followers of Christ. We have one faith, one Lord, one God and Father, who is above all and in you all. Then let there be a glorifying of God with one mouth and one spirit. Where there is union, there is what? Strength. There is strength. United we stand, divided we fall. Amen? Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> so I got a challenge for you this week. And that is this. Let's, let's spend some time in prayer and, and meditation focusing on this idea of unity. What does it mean? Define it for yourself. When it comes to unity in, in Christ. What does that mean to you? And, and practice it this week. Take some time this week and practice it around other people and, and so that others will know uh, where you are coming from on that. Okay, everybody all right? Deep breath. Feel better? How about... Oh, no, that's Lamaze. Never mind. Just a deep breath. All right. If you'll bow your heads with me, I will close in my usual way. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And everybody said?